All right. What is your pleasure? Any questions in general or EPP specifically you'd like to go over today? With which one? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. The sink, yeah, the one problem, yeah, you can pass that in, please. There's one practice problem due for homework. <coughs> Just back to Will is fine. <laughs> but it was a boiling point, it was a boiling point elevation problem, right? So when we go over boiling point elevation, the functions, I mean, uh, Tyler's already asked to go over three, t over EPP 10, so we're gonna do that one. But I mean, practically speaking, in terms of the formula, yeah, that's fine. In terms of the formula or the process, the concept of why it boils higher and why it freezes lower. Um, don't think of, again, don't think of that as temperature based, okay? Because we tend to think of water. Um, let's say, for example, this coffee cup that I have. Inside, there's a liquid, right? On the outside here, there's solid. Let's say that this is aluminum. Probably not, but let's assume it's aluminum. Could I say that this is frozen aluminum? Why not? It's solid. What's, what, what does it need to be in order to be frozen? It is cold for aluminum. See, the idea of frozen is a concept which means that it's now a solid, where it could be a liquid, okay? Remember we talked about how every element can be a liquid, a gas, or a solid based upon the temperature and pressure, okay? This metal is frozen because it's in a temperature that's lower than its point of becoming solid from liquid. If I were to heat this up, is there a place where it would melt? Isn't the melting point and the freezing point the same thing based upon the direction you're moving? I could say that this is frozen aluminum, frozen whatever, the, this is frozen plastic. Is plastic ever a liquid? Why is it not a liquid now? Its temperature is below its freezing point. See, I'm just getting through this idea that we tend to think of freezing as something that's based upon zero degrees Celsius, and the only reason we think zero degrees Celsius is because we're actually thinking about water. But if we think about something else, the temperature that we're currently at, the ambient temperature in this room, is below the freezing point of everything that's solid. Okay. So freezing doesn't have to do with zero degrees Celsius. Freezing has to do with taking enough energy away because heat and temperature, that's a way to measure energy. We recognize it as the way it feels because we're energy receivers when it's warm and it's drawing our energy out of us when we feel cold. I mean, that's what's happening in the house when the, when the AC is on too cold. Your heat is being pulled out of you into the environment. You're warming up the room. The room is cold, so you're warming it up. Okay, so when something is frozen, it's not necessarily based upon its temperature or don't think of it directly as temperature. Think of it as that point where the energy that's been withdrawn from it causes it to go from a liquid to a solid. That'll give you more accurate understanding of what it means for something to freeze. Think about it this way. If it were possible to remove that energy and still keep the same ambient temperature, you could freeze things at higher temperatures if that energy couldn't, from the surrounding couldn't get into them, okay, if you could isolate them. So it doesn't have to do specifically with temperature, though temperature is one way that we measure it. And we have senses in our body that feel it. So we're attuned to it. But get away from thinking that freezing happens at zero degrees Celsius. That's only true for water, for distilled water with no solute in it. Okay, once we start adding solute, it's gonna freeze at a lower temperature. What does that mean? It's gonna transition from a liquid to a solid phase at a lower temperature. Why? Because we have to take more energy out of it. And in the same way, the boiling point, that point at which we move from a liquid phase to a gas phase, is another energy point. 
everything that's in this room now that's a gas, it is above the pressure temperature combination at which it becomes a gas from being a liquid. There's oxygen in the air. Are you familiar with liquid oxygen? So why is the oxygen in the air not a liquid? Why aren't we swimming? Though in terms of aerodynamics, we could argue we are swimming, we just don't realize it. But why is it that around us we have gaseous oxygen, gaseous nitrogen? Why is it in gas form? Because there's enough energy in it for it not to be a liquid. And that energy in it, to us, is communicated in terms of temperature. It feels warm. Why? Because of the energy that's in the space. Because of the energy that's technically in that gas, the energy that's in those molecules is keeping them moving so fast that they don't want to be confined close to one another. They're bouncing off the walls, so they are, they're, a, they're a gas. But if we take energy out of them, they would at some point become a liquid. What would we call that point? Going from liquid to solid, or excuse me, from liquid to gas, we call it the boiling point, right? Going from a gas to a liquid, we call it the point of condensation or condensing point. So if we took what's gas now, it's not frozen, it's not even, it's not a liquid, it's a gas. Remember, frozen means solid form. Yes, Will? Say that again for the first part. Uh, is that why things like liquid nitrogen are at such a low temperature? Why liquid nitrogen is at such a low temperature? Yeah, because in order for it to be a liquid, or excuse me, for it to be liquid and not be gaseous, because again, at the normal atmospheric temperature pressure that we live in, it would be in a gas form. So for it to be something other than gas, it either has to be under high pressure or a low temperature or a combination of those two things. Right. So when we talk about boiling point, to actually compute it is simply applying the boiling point change in temperature formula, right? Computing a delta T. So when we get the I, we get the K sub B, and we get the molality, with those three things we can compute the delta T. For a boiling point elevation, it's going to be a positive number because we're going to take the original boiling point and make it higher. It's going to take more energy for it to go from a liquid to a gas phase. For a freezing point, it's got the negative I. Starts with the negative 1 times I times K sub F times molality because our delta T is going to be negative because we're going to depress the freezing point. We're going to elevate the boiling point and depress the freezing point. Okay. So whether, you use, whether you're using the boiling point elevation or freezing point depression, and again, I've done this a couple times, but it's not specific in the book, that the T final is equal to the T initial plus delta T. If you remember that, the T final is equal to the T initial plus the delta T. The delta T in freezing point depression is going to be a negative number. What does that mean? We're going to start with the temperature where it normally would freeze, the solvent, and we're going to make it lower because it's going to be a negative number, which is going to give us a freezing point or final point that's lower. If we're talking about boiling point elevation, we take the initial boiling point of the solvent and we add the delta T, which in this case will be a positive because it doesn't have a negative I, K, sub B. It's a positive I, K, sub B, molality. So we get a positive number, which means our final boiling point is going to be our initial boiling point of the solvent plus however many degrees it goes up because of the solute. Okay. So our delta T and you might even put this delta T for boiling, right? Delta T for boiling is equal to I K sub boiling molality. I don't believe we're ever going to have you solve for a K sub B. You're going to be given that. In fact, on the EPP's top extra practice problems right under that, the K sub F for water is, the K sub B for water is. They give it to you. So you've got this one given to you. I, again, that's based upon the nature of the molecule. So if it's a covalent molecule, the I is always going to be 1, correct? The only time it's not going to be 1 is if it's ionic. And if it's ionic, the number is going to be equal to the number of components or pieces that the ionic molecule breaks down into. So if there are two ions together, 
it breaks down into two pieces. If there are three ions, it breaks down three pieces. Remember that a polyatomic ion is one and it won't break down any farther because once it breaks away from the cation that's attached to in most cases, or in the case of ammonium, it's got an anion, but whenever they do that breakup, once it breaks up, the polyatomic ion is itself a covalent molecule and it will not break down anymore. The other ions will scatter. So count that polyatomic ion as one. Or if it's a sub two, it's two, right? Whatever the subscript is, that many polyatomic ions, count them up. So your eye is going to come from how the nature of how that molecule or that solute breaks down in both freezing and boiling. So that's the same way to think about this. You're going to be given this. It's the same way to compute this. The molality. The molality is the moles of solute per what? Mole solute per kilograms solvent. Okay. Another way to do moles solute is going to be mass solute divided by molar mass solute. Right? That's the same thing. If you think about your solution diagram moving down, you've got mass, molar mass, moles. How do I get moles? Mass divided by molar mass gives me moles. So if I told you that you've got so many moles of a solute, you just plug that in over kilograms of solvent. If I give you a mass of the solute, you divide that by the molar mass of the solute, and then divide that by the kilograms of solvent to give you your molality. So it's the same thing as before. So number 10 says, what is the boiling point of a solution made by mixing 50 grams so my solute is 50 grams of ammonium sulfide. So what's ammonium sulfide going to be? What's the formula for ammonium sulfide? So what is a, OK, ammonium is, what's the formula for ammonium? Isn't ammonium NH4? That's ammonium. Okay. What's the charge of an ammonium polyatomic ion? It's the only positive one we have, right? Possible positive one. It's got to be that because our second sulfide, what's the, it's not a sulfate, it's not a sulfite, it's a sulfide, meaning that it is not a polyatomic ion, is it? It's just an ion an anion. Sulfide, it's a column six element. So in its natural state, what is its charge going to be? It wants to, to be a negative two, doesn't it? It wants to go to negative eight. It's at negative six. It wants eight for the octet rule. So it wants to go to, if we just briefly put our symbols up here, this wants to become new, two negative and this is already one positive. So if we transpose and drop the signs, we know that we've got NH4, 2S. Why? It takes two ammonium to balance out one sulfide ion. All right. So the solute is 50 grams of ammonium sulfide. And our solute or excuse me, our solvent is 375 grams of H2O. And what is the new boiling point? Okay, so let's just go ahead. We're going to compute the new boiling point. We know that it's going to be some change from the original boiling point. The original boi boiling point is water, so it's going to be 100 degrees Celsius. So the new boiling point is going to be somewhere away from 100, but close to 100. So my T initial here was 100 degrees. I need to compute delta T to find my final temperature or my new boiling point. My delta T boiling, here's the formula. What is my I going to be for ammonium sulfide? Three, because I have two ammoniums. Once they break apart, they stay as ammonium ions, polyatomic ions. They're covalent molecules. They don't break up any farther. The one, two, and then the sulfide is three. So my I is three. It's a positive three because we're doing boiling point. 
If we're doing freezing point, it would be a negative I, or negative three in this case. Since we're doing boiling point, it's three. The K sub B is given to you, 0 0.512. And then we have to deal with molality. All right. So molality, remember, is either going to be moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent. But what's another way of doing, since we're not given moles of solute, right, we're given grams of solute, we have to take the mass of solute given and divide that by the molar mass of one of those molecules. So let's do the math there real quick. Sulfur is 32. We've got one of those. And now we've got to do the NH4, the ammonium. Nitrogen is going to be 14. 14 plus 4 is 18, right? 18 for one ammonium because it's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Hydrogen is 1. So it's going to be 18, but I need two of them, right? So yeah. So this is my sulfur ion, 18 for each of my ammonium ions. So 68, right? Math good? OK. 68. 68 what? <coughs> Tell me the truth. Am ammonium sulfide, 68 grams per mole and 68. AMUs per molecule, right? 68 AMUs per molecule, yeah, that's true, and it's also true that it's 68 grams per mole. So I have to divide my mass by my molar mass of 68, and I have to divide all of that then again by kilograms of solvent. My solvent, I've got 375 grams, which <coughs> becomes 0 0.3750 grams or kilograms, right? So that's the entire math right there. I times K sub B times moles, don't have moles, but I do have mass divided by the molar mass, which is the same as moles, divided by kilograms of solvent. Do the math on your little magic machine, and it'll give you your delta T. Let me go ahead and check in senior answer key here. Fifty grams, sixty-eight point, approximately three degrees. Let's say that it's three degrees Celsius. So the math there comes out to be approximately three degrees Celsius. The answer key had sixty-eight point two. I did some quick rounding to make it easy. So we're in the ballpark. Three degrees Celsius is the delta T. The question didn't ask what is the delta T. The question asked. Always go back to the to the what it was asked for. So you might want to say over here, the temperature boiling equals what? To remind yourself, that's the question I'm actually answering. You'll often get this far and say, what's the answer? Three degrees Celsius. Wrong. Because the question wasn't well, how many degrees is the boiling point elevated. The question was, what is the final boiling point? So my T final. is equal to the T initial. What is the initial boiling point? Well, it's water. So it's 100 degrees Celsius plus my delta T, which is 3 degrees Celsius. So my final boiling point is 103 degrees Celsius. Is it always 100 degrees? Hmm? Is it always 100 degrees? For water. For water. It's always 100 degrees, yes, for water. It's not 100 degrees for my coffee cup. Right? <coughs> so that's a boiling point elevation problem. Exactly the same math process as freezing point depression, except that formula has a negative I and uses K sub F. And you'll be given K sub B or K sub F. You will be expected to logic into the I, and you will be expected to be able to compute the molality in order to calculate the delta T. And then apply that delta T to your initial temperature to get your final temperature. 
either boiling point elevation or freezing point depression. All right. Helpful? Good? Good stuff? Hopefully? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I saw your body, which I can't avoid, in her hand, and I just kind of went, yes, it. No, that's not right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Or how many components here? This is ionic, so it's one, two, three. So like if it was ink chloride, you would have zinc and CO2 and one, two, three. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. I didn't know the initial uh, boiling point was just not quite what. They will have to give it to you. They'll have to. If I said, for example, what would be the f boiling point of acetone? You're like, well, I can compute the. I compute the delta T for acetone if you give me the case of B or the case of F for acetone. And I can compute the molality like with anything else with a solute in it. All I can tell you then is how, how much that temperature is going to change for, for boiling or freezing. But I have to give you what it, what it normally freezes at with no solute in it. So your initial freezing point or your initial boiling point of the pure solvent would have to be given to you. <coughs> Or we could give you all the components so that you could compute the delta T, and I tell you what the final is, and you have to compute what the initial would be. But it's, the math is going to be there. You're going to have to be given it or given everything else to compute it. Generally speaking, you're, you're going to be given, <coughs> generally speaking, you're going, to be, you're going to be given your K sub F or your K sub B, and you're going to be given your initial boiling point or your initial freezing point for the solvent. So yeah, for the solvent. And then you'll be given a solute that you can then use to compute molality. And you'll either be given the formula or have to be able to know the formula for the solute so that you can compute the I. So you can see how many different components are there. For the I, you've got to remember your polyatomic ions. You've got to remember how to construct a neutral molecule. Then you've got to also know whether it's a covalent or ionic in order to determine the I. There's a lot of learning that we've done up to this point just to come up with that one number, that integer number for your I value. You could say the first eight modules were all about how to determine I. If, if this was your focus, like what is chemistry all about? Computing new boiling points and freezing points. Okay, we did eight and a half modules of how to compute I. Just so we could finally know the language to solve this formula. But there was more than that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you number nine? Can I? Yeah. I can. Would you like to, us to do nine together? OK, that's a different question. I'm sorry. That's one for me. I, I think I can do almost every problem in this book. <laughs> so this is just a freezing point depression, but you're computing molality. OK, that's, that's the difference. Rather than, rather than having molality be part of your, rather than having molality as, <laughs> don't make me pass out the goggles. <laughs> rather than having molality as something you compute to determine delta T, in this case, you've, you're going to use, you're going to solve for molality, right? What must the molality be? All right. I'm not so concerned about people losing an eye when I throw this fuzzy thing. I should, I should keep the good one and throw the one that's all full of marker dust. <coughs> okay, if you want to lower, stop right there. If you want to lower, if you look ahead, you can see it's a freezing point, right? If you want to lower, just from that, I know that we're going to be talking about Delta T equals negative I K sub F M. I know that. If I want to lower what? Water's freezing point. My solvent <coughs> is H2O. My temperature for freezing of my solvent is 
zero degrees Celsius. How do I know? It's water. If I want to lower water's freezing point by 10 degrees Celsius, delta T equals negative 10 degrees Celsius. I want to lower its freezing point by 10 degrees. So my delta T has got to be negative. I want to lower it by 10 degrees. By adding calcium chloride, my solute is going to be calcium chloride. What must be the molality of the salt solution? Okay, what must the molality be? Notice I'm not given how many grams of calcium chloride. I'm not given how many moles of calcium chloride. I'm not told how many kilograms of water. Because in the lab, if you were assisting me, I would just tell you I need a sodium water, uh, you know, a sodium, or excuse me, a calcium chloride solution at, and I'd give you the mol molality and cut you loose and have you go make it. Because there's multiple combinations of it, right? There's different amounts compared to different, the more solvent I give you, the more solute you're going to need. So I might tell you how much of it I want, and you gotta figure all that stuff out. But for right now, what must the molality be? Well, if I'm solving for molality, and I know I'm using this formula over here, right? It's the only formula I really need. Molality is equal to what? I'm gonna solve, I'm gonna rearrange the, the formula to solve for my unknown variable, what I'm being asked for. I was trying to figure out a way to have Serena cover her face so I could, could do it, but. All right, if you need to stand, please do. Solve for the molality. What does this formula look like rearranged to solve for molality? Yes, sir. It's algebra. Algebra one. Okay? Pushing on back to pre algebra. So somewhere between eighth grade and ninth grade, you learned this. Okay. So M equals delta T over quantity negative I K sub F. Do I have delta T? Yes. yes. Can I compute I? Yes. Am I given my K sub F? Yeah. Yep. Because my solvent is water and I know that my K sub F is 1.86. So, delta T is negative 10 divided by negative, what is my I? It's ionic? Yes? Count them up. One, two, three divided by negative one times three times K sub F, 1.86. My negative is gonna cancel my negative, it's the same thing as dividing by negative is the same as adding by, you know, as multiplying by, well, let me take that back. Dividing by the negative is probably easier for you conceptually to say that the negatives cancel each other out. How's that? Let's just say it that way. So we've got 10, divided by three times 1.86. That's 5.4, 5.58, okay? So it's 10 divided by 5.58, and it's gonna be a little bit less than two. Again, I'm ballparking here just so concept-wise. You'd plug it in your calculator, and we'll say that that's 1.87 or something like that, all right? Yeah, so it's negative 10 over negative i. They cancel each other out. Negative divided by negative is a positive. So my delta T, to get my delta T, I need to have a solution of calcium chloride with a molality of 1.87. 1.78, or 1.87, or whatever the actual math turns out to be. That's my, my guesstimate, molality. If I have a solution, that, you know, if I were to make that in the lab, there's many different ways I could put that solution together. But as long as that has a molality of about 1.87, it will decrease the freezing point by 10 degrees, which means it'll now freeze at negative 10 as opposed to zero. 
I mean, you do the same thing in your car, right? When you put antifreeze in the radiator, you don't put pure water in. Because if you put pure water in your radiator and you come out in the morning after a nice cold night, you have a solid block. Pipes are probably broken, split, things are all apart, right? We had glycanol in it, antifreeze. Antifreeze keeps it from freezing, hence the name antifreeze. That, is the, that goes into the mixture. That mixture has a freezing point much lower than water. The freezing point of that solution is now lower, generally, than the temperatures we, ex we experience naturally. That's what keeps your block from freezing up due to temperature. Does that mean it can never go that low? No. That's why up north, where we used to live, and even farther north, they have special formulas that take that, that freezing point way down much lower than you guys need to worry about here in the Mid-South, Northern South, <coughs> Mid-America. How's that? Louisville is the northernmost southern city or the southernmost northern city. We keep having that debate back and forth. So you guys wore blue-gray during the Civil War. <laughs>